talk from that. Uh, please feel free to submit any questions that you may have uh, during the presentation or during, his, uh, during the Q&A session. If you prefer to remain anonymous, you can select this option in Q&A. Uh, please don't use a chat function to submit questions. Only use this if you've got a technical problem and you want to check whether it's your end or at our end. Uh, please submit the questions using Q&A. What I'm going to do, I'm going to give the floor to Matt to give an outline of the book, and then after that, I will uh, move to Q&A. Um, and I'll also ask you to, if, even if you haven't asked a uh, question yourself, to go to the Q&A function and feel free to vote on the questions in case we have more questions than time allows. And this will help me to select question, the most popular questions. So now to our speaker. I'm delighted to be joined by Matt Ridley, who's an award-winning writer. His books have sold millions of copies worldwide and have been translated into, I believe, 31 languages. He's been a regular columnist, a columnist for The Times, The Telegraph, and The Wall Street Journal, and he received the IEA's Free Enterprise Award in 2014. As Viscount Ridley, he was elected to the House of Lords in February 2013 and sits on the Science and Technology Select Committee of the House of Lords. Matt, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to say about your book. Uh, I'll hand the floor over to you now, and then I'll uh, move to questions. Thank you, Matt, for joining us. Over to you. So you, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's great to be with you. And, and the IEA played a part in the uh, genesis of this book because I was asked to give uh, a lecture for the IEA. I decided to do it on innovation. And after I'd finished it, I thought, this might make a book if I do some proper research. Uh, and so I set out and did so. Um, and the book is mostly stories. It's the stories of invention, stories from, of the steam engine, of the search engine, of vaccines, of vaping, of um, the S-Bend in the toilet of zero, of uh, all sorts of things that have changed the world and how they came about. And what worked rather well for me was that just by telling the stories, uh, patterns began to emerge, the common themes that, 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 that occur. And I distilled these into a couple of chapters at the end of the book about uh, what, what, uh, how innovation works. What is it? Why does it happen to us and not to rabbits or rocks? What, what, What's what causes it to be um, fast in some areas and slow in others, uh, and things like that. Um, and so I'm going to run through those sort of distilled out themes. Uh, but just before I do so, it's worth just mentioning that, you know, I, I, the plan was to launch this book in a quiet period in the spring of 2020 when not much else was going on. Um, that didn't work out. Uh, it came out in the U in the UK. US um, right in the middle of the pandemic uh, and it came out in the UK just as the entire world decided to have race riots uh, and the like so um, that wasn't great background to launch a book but I think the book has huge relevance to the crises of 2020 it's about how to innovate innovation is how we will solve the pandemic it's how we will get back on the road to prosperity as I say in the book uh, innovation is the uh, child of freedom, but the parent of prosperity. And the themes that I think are important when you're thinking about innovation is, first of all, that it's more than just invention. So in this book, I make a big point of saying I'm, I'm writing about innovators, not inventors. In other words, people who uh, took new ideas and turned them into something that was practical, affordable, and available to, to ordinary people, which is a huge job. It's often a much bigger job than the original inventor realizes. Uh, and uh, so. Uh, you know, th th there's a lot of work to, in turning in turning something into something that everybody wants. You know, I think Jeff Bezos at Amazon is an innovator more than he's an inventor. Uh, he has caused us to change our ways uh, as consumers um, rather than uh, necessarily giving us one new widget. Um, there's quite a nice story told by Charles Towns, the inventor of the laser, about the uh, about invention. He says there's a beaver and a rabbit looking at the Hoover Dam. And the beaver says, no, I didn't build it, but it is based on an idea of mine. And that's true of a lot of inventors. They feel, hang on, I invented that. How come someone else is getting all the credit, making all the profit out of it? Uh, and the answer is because a lot of work has to go into turning your invention into an innovation that's practical and available to ordinary people. I argue in the book that innovation is a more gradual process than we think. We tend to think of it as disruptive and revolutionary, but in fact, if you look at uh, the innovation in detail, you find that there's 
there's a lot of predecessor steps towards something becoming dis, uh, disruptive, and there's a lot of successor steps as well. Uh, and something like Moore's law describes innovation really rather well, which is that it inches forward from step to step. Um, we knew in the mid 1960s, because Gordon Moore guessed it, that computers were going to were going to roughly double in uh, efficiency, price efficiency every 18 months. But we that didn't enable us to jump 50 years ahead and say, right, well, we'll do that now. We still had to march through those intermediate technologies uh, in this steady progression to get there. Um, innovation is also evolutionary. And by that, I mean, when you get into an airplane, you rather hope that it's been designed by a clever person, don't you? But is that really true? Because all that clever person really did was he took a previous design of an airplane and he made a few adjustments. He said, I'm going to make it bigger. I'm going to make the wings longer. I'm going to make the um, engines different, something like that. And that previous plane was likewise adapted from a previous one and so on right back to the first plane that ever flew right back to the wright brothers um, and at some point along that way bad ideas were discarded or rather they probably crashed so for example having square windows in an airplane turned out to be a bad idea it caused weaknesses in the fuselage and it caused some crashes and that's why windows are never square cornered uh, in airplanes today they've always got this sort of rounded uh, shape um, so uh, along the way, natural selection has worked on the descent with modification of technologies just as it does uh, with biological systems. Innovation is serendipitous. That is to say, innovators often change direction, often surprise themselves with what they found. The post-it note, Kevlar, Teflon, three examples of things that were discovered by people looking for something completely different. In the case of the post-it note, they were looking for a permanent glue uh, they found a temporary glue and were about to discard it when Art Fry thought, hang on, this is quite useful for marking my place in my hymn book when I'm in church. Uh, and so the post-it note was born. Innovation like evolution is recombinant. That is to say it takes existing technologies and combines them in different ways to make new technologies. Nearly every technology comes about by that means. And innovation like evolution depends heavily on trial and error. If you talk to great innovators from Thomas Edison to Jeff Bezos, they all say the same thing. You have to try a lot of things and you have to make a lot of mistakes. You have to make a lot of errors. If you're not swinging and missing, you're not going to swing and hit. I believe that's a baseball analogy. I don't really understand it, but I think you get the point. Um, uh, and, you know, Jeff, uh, not Jeff Bezos, Thomas Edison tried 5,000 different plants to find the right material for the filament of his first light bulb. You know, most innovators put a huge amount of elbow grease into the work that they do. Innovation is a team sport. You consult lots of people. The Wright brothers did it right. They talked to lots of people who had built gliders, who'd studied birds, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas Samuel Langley at exactly the same time did it wrong. He did it in secret on his own and built an airplane which didn't work, uh, despite the fact that he had a huge grant from the US government and the Wright brothers didn't. Um, innovation can be surprisingly inexorable and inevitable. That is to say, 21 different people came up with the idea of the light bulb independently. Uh, there's Edison in America, there's Swan in England, there's Lodigan in Russia, there's a whole bunch of other people in France and Belgium and other places. And the same thing is true of the search engine. In the early 1990s, lots of people came up with uh, prototypes of search engines. And it's hard to imagine the world without light bulbs coming into existence in the 1870s or search engines coming into existence in the 1990s. Why? Because the technologies that they were to use, the electricity system, the glass blowing technologies, the vacuum pumps uh, that you need to make a, a light bulb, had arrived at the point where it was inevitable that people would try it out, and the same with search engines. But there's a strange paradox here. In retrospect, the search engine looks devastatingly obvious. I mean, surely once we've got an internet, once we're networking everybody's computers, then a huge prize is going to go to the person who develops a, a way for us to find our way through the internet. In fact, almost nobody saw it coming. There's very few predictions of the role of search, 
uh, in the future. Search engine is the most useful invention of my lifetime, bar none, I think. And yet nobody, even, even Sergey Brin and Larry Page inventing Google didn't think they were inventing a search engine. They thought they were cataloging the internet. So there's a strange asymmetry in innovation. It's amazingly unpredictable uh, in prospect, but it's uh, very um, uh, uh, obvious in retrospect. Innovation likes fragmented governance. The reason the Song dynasty in China produced gunpowder and compasses, printed, printing and paper money and all these different things was because the Song dynasty knew how to delegate. They knew how to devolve decisions down to local level. They were insistent on it. They were obsessed with it. The Ming dynasty killed that system by centralizing everything, by, by having uh, all decisions taken by, by mandarins and bureaucrats, uh, and, you know, a merchant had to get permission to leave his home village under the Ming emperors. Um, that's a sort of metaphor, a microcosm, a parable, if you like, of what's happened in most empires ever since. Um, most empires are really bad at innovation, just as most big companies are very bad at innovation. You need a fragmented system uh, to create innovation. That's why America's been so good at it, because it was essentially a very fragmented, a very devolved system, a system of city-states, if you like, like Renaissance Italy or ancient Greece. Innovation is just as often the seed of science as it is the fruit of science. This is a really important point. We tend to think, and our policymakers tend to think quite wrongly, of a linear model of innovation that you start with a philosophical discovery in, by an academic in a university, you spin it out, and you make a prototype, uh, and then eventually you apply it in a way that the consumer has access to. That sometimes happens, but much more often, what happens is that technologies are developed based on pre previous technologies by tinkering, uh, and that at some point, in order to understand and improve what they're doing, the technologists go back to the academics and say, can you explain what's going on here? That's how most of the electronic technologies developed. It's how the steam engine developed. It didn't develop out of thermodynamics, quite the reverse. It's how gene editing is developed. Uh, the CRISPR technology of gene editing uh, looks like an ap academic discovery that's being applied. But actually, if you go back into its early history, which is only about 10 years ago, uh, you find uh, that it was uh, the yogurt industry trying to understand how bacteria caught infectious viruses uh, that led to the discovery of the special sequences that you use in CRISPR. Innovation creates jobs, it doesn't destroy them. We've been worrying for 200 years since the Luddites that innovation will destroy jobs. It doesn't. It creates new ways of people uh, making their living and supplying each other's needs. Uh, it reduces the amount of time you have to work during your life or during a week uh, in order to supply your needs. Yes, it can help in that, but it doesn't take away the need uh, or the opportunity for lots of other people to work. Um, innovation could be infinite, I think. That is to say, uh, if you say, well, you can't innovate forever in a finite world uh, because resources will eventually run out, I would reply, well, hang on, an innovation can consist of using less of a resource, not using more of a resource. We currently use about 13% as much aluminium in a drinks can as we did when drinks cans were first invented. Um, we use 68% less land to produce a given quantity of food as we did. Agriculture uses less water than it did. In fact, the UK economy uses less stuff that is to say, minerals and fuels and things like that, either imported or uh, mined and produced at home, than it did 10 years ago, despite an increasing population. That's fascinating. And that, to me, says that when ecologists, including David Attenborough, say that you cannot have infinite growth in a finite world, I think they're probably wrong. The final point and I think the most important one, is that innovation flourishes in freedom. It requires the freedom of the innovator to do an experiment, to try something, to uh, attract investment, to make a mistake and start again, to change direction, and just as important, the freedom of the consumer to express a wish to have a new device or a new opportunity. Um, uh, that's what draws out uh, the innovation process. And so in the end of my book, I confront the puzzle, and this is very relevant to 2020, 
of why China has become probably the most innovative part of the world today when it's not a free country? And my answer is quite simple, which is that economically, China has been quite free for the last 30 or 40 years. An entrepreneur setting up a business or trying to do an innovation in China has had to run into very few of the, the things that stop entrepreneurs in the West, that is to say, opposition from Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, uh, regulations enforced by sluggish bureaucrats who won't give fast decisions, um, uh, op occupational licensing, or patents, the patents that get in the way which somebody else has patented and, and is just using it to defend his monopoly and is not letting you get on with developing your innovation. These are the things that slow down innovators in the West, and there have been far fewer of them uh, in China. The only innovation you couldn't do in China, of course, was start a new political party uh, or something like that. Um, and I think that this is changing. That is to say, I think the Xi regime is so Ming-like, so centralizing, so dirigiste uh, and so uh, communist um, that it will kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. Uh, and the, the, the freewheeling culture that has produced Alibaba and Tencent and all these extraordinary consumer uses of electronics that Chinese are doing faster than the rest of us will is doomed uh, unless the Chinese regime learns to uh, delegate and to allow a lot more economic freedom. And on that point, I'll end, but I'll just add that without innovation, we would be desperately poorer and it's the one thing that will get us back to prosperity after the economic crisis that will follow the current pa current pandemic well thank you very much matt um, and uh, what maybe what i'll ask you to do as well is we'll find details of your book that we can advertise uh, for you to, to to the viewers but thank you very much uh, for joining us um i'm going to open it up to questions i see we've already got a couple in at the moment we've got about 40 minutes so please send them but let me uh, exercise chairman's prerogative and ask you a couple of questions to start off with. When, I wonder if I could ask you about the way history judges inventors and innovators, and I know you say it's not always the same thing, um, but you, know, you talk about 21 people invented a light bulb at the same time. We have, we have you know, uh, examples of more than one person inventing the telephone at the same time, for example. Does history judge the inventor as, is it basically the best person at PR or marketing who, um, you know, who becomes judged by history because they were great, they were there to tell a story that they invented it, or is, or is, it some, or is there something more uh, complicated than that? No. Is it really a, a combination of not only innovation, but marketing and PR? It's definitely a bit of that. There's no question. Uh, and, you know, someone like Edison was, was a good self-publicist. Um, someone like Nikola Tesla probably wasn't so good and probably deserves to be more famous. Um, and there are cases where the wrong person got the Nobel Prize or the patent or whatever, clearly. But as I say, what history tends to do is single out individuals and give them too much heroic status, too much credit. Um, and actually, what the, the problem is, the people on whose shoulders they stood being left in the shadows and the people who followed them and turned their ideas into something really practical. I'm a huge admirer of Norman Borlaug, who was the man who gave us the Green Revolution because he developed dwarf varieties of wheat in Mexico and then persuaded the Indians and Pakistanis to grow them and turned India from a starving country into a food exporting country in about six short years. It was an extraordinary turnaround. Now, Borlaug deserves enormous credit. But as I point out in the book, he couldn't have achieved that without Swaminathan in India, uh, you know, helping him and paving the way for him. And likewise, he couldn't have achieved it without getting the idea for dwarf wheat varieties from a man named Burton Bales, who'd got it from a man named Orville Vogel, who'd got it from a man named Cecil Salmon, who'd got it when he was in Japan at the end of the Second World War, where he had come across some uh, dwarf wheats grown by a, developed by a man called John Gonjiro in Azuka, uh, who had got it from somewhere else. So, you know, let's 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 understand the pedigree of these ideas a bit more and so when we put watt or stevenson or uh, newcomen on a pedestal we're right to do so in some sense but there's too much of the great man theory of history about that there's not enough about the collaborative collective uh, sharing nature of innovation 
I'll put another question before I turn to the Q and A uh, questions that uh, the viewers have been asking. It's one about openness of an economy and innovation. So when people think about Silicon Valley, uh, it's not really Americans who are necessarily innovative to make America the most innovative. They're open to the best people in the world. You hear stories of you know uh, Chinese innovators, curry corridors with people from India, for example. But that's all seen as a U.S. innovation or a Silicon Valley, but people from the rest of the world. I remember when I was in the European Parliament, we used to have these debates about European innovation, but it tended to be much narrower, that they wanted to know how Europeans can innovate. And I've always thought it was far too, uh, you know, far too narrow. But contrast that with China. You know, because China isn't necessarily a country that's open to people from the rest of the world, but you talk about it being a great innovator. What are the lessons there, do you think, in terms of openness and innovation? Well, I think it's possible today that you don't need openness to individuals moving into your country to the same extent that you did used to. You're absolutely right that, you know, one of the, uh, the, the you know, why did Marconi move from Italy to, to England? Because the opportunities were there. Why did Charles Parsons move from uh, Ireland to Tyneside? Um, why did Gutenberg move from, um, I think it's Mainz to Strasbourg, or is it the other way around? I can't remember. Um, one of the great secrets of European civilization was that you had these different countries with different regimes and innovators could move to find where they would get a good hearing. And it's no accident that innovation has happened in trading places, places where, where a lot of trade is happening. So I talk in the book about Fibonacci, this um, 12th century uh, merchant who went from Pisa to North Africa and picked up the whole Indian numeral system, including zero, and brought it back to Europe. Um, uh, so that's the kind of thing that happened a lot of the time. But today, in China or elsewhere, you can send Chinese students abroad to pick up ideas and bring them back, which obviously they've been doing, or you can just get the ideas off the internet. I mean, one of the things that's possibly happening now is that ideas are flying around the world much faster than they used to without necessarily being attached to people in the same way. Um, uh, and that kind of openness is probably m uh, even more important than openness to, to movement of people. Although I still think movement of people is important. Uh, you know, I think, I think, you know, I, I arrived at Heathrow um, on Sunday and there are huge banner adverts saying, we have a new talent visa. It could be you. Please apply. Great. That was lovely to see. Right, so let's go to the uh, questions. I think people have had enough of me asking them. So let's, uh, Sarah Estelle asks, what, what's your stance on and the argument for or against patents? There are clearly trade-offs involved in intellectual property rights, et cetera. What's your take? And we also have a very similar question from another attendee. So, yep. you know, we've had the debate here at the IA. Maybe I'll post a link there on the debate that we've had internally at the IA in one of the editions of EA Magazine. But what's your take on this? Well, I'm very sceptical about patents. Uh, I don't think they help innovation much at all, um, certainly in their present form. Um, obviously, there are uh, cases where it would be very hard to understand people doing any work in innovation without the ability to make a monopoly profit afterwards, such as drug discovery. But let's leave that on one side and talk about the generality. We tend to think of intellectual property as property, you know, the, the, the whole point of you don't improve your house unless you own it. So why would you bother to innovate if, unless you could own the results of your innovation? But that's a false analogy because you're trying to give away what you've done in intellectual property, whereas you're trying to keep a hold of your house. In other words, you can share intellectual property in a way that you can't share your own home. Uh, and But more to the point, the empirical evidence that patents help innovation simply isn't there. Study after study of countries around the world have shown that when they strengthen their patent system, they do not get an increase in innovation. And when they weaken their patent system, they do not get a decrease in innovation. Um, uh, and, you, the, you know, the empirical evidence is really strong on this. And I was very struck by it. I mean, I thought intuitively it seems obvious that if you give people reward, they will do more innovating. Um, but most of them can get their reward through working harder and being first into the market. That's what happens in the software industry. There's very little significant patenting goes on in the software industry. Um, people just get ahead and do it better. You know, I mean, Amazon is not a company that depends on patents to any 
very significant degree. It did, it did try and patent the double click technology at one point. It got a lot of grief for doing so. So um, I think patents and copyrights are hugely overrated. And I think it's rather shocking that we've strengthened them so much, really under lobbying from lawyers and people like that. Um, uh, uh, Shakespeare had very little uh, uh, opportunity to enforce his copyright. It didn't stop him writing plays. The effect of Napster and other um, music sharing uh, technologies was to destroy copyright in the music industry effectively. Um, did that lead to a collapse of music making? No, quite the reverse. There's been even more than before. Um, is it right that my great grandchildren in 70 years time could still be sorry 70 years after my death could still be making money from my books no of course not they should get a job why on earth should they have that why is that law there because the disney corporation wanted it there that's why etc so that's my very skeptical view on patents patents whatever you're supposed to call them uh, and uh, copyright um, I'm happy, you know. I'm happy to agree there are nuances around the, the side, and very hard to go cold turkey, you know. And I believe in shorter, simpler patents um, uh, as alternatives to the long ones, which you should make very difficult to get. Um, also, there's a burst of innovation when a patent expires. Uh, this was true very recently with the the key patents on 3D printing. They expired, and there was suddenly a raft of new technologies out there and a huge fall in the price of, of these technologies. So I'm sorry, but patents just drive up prices and slow down innovation. That's my view. Okay, well, we've got lots of questions coming in. We've got about 17 questions. We're clearly not going to get through them all in the next half hour. So I'm going to ask viewers uh, in Zoom to go to the Q&A function and vote on their, uh, which question they believe merits being asked. And we'll, let, we'll look at the league table as they zoom up to the top and I ask, that question on, on their behalf. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm also going to alternate between named questioners and all, um, anonymous questioners, so it's not all dominated by anonymous attendees. So uh, next question is from Chris Larson, and he said he asked two questions, but the second bit is a bit uh, is a, quite a quick question. How would you weigh the value of trusted relationships within an in, 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 uh, innovative ecosystem, either via kindred pursuits or serendipitous? Serendipitous, sorry, I'm not pronouncing it very well tonight. Uh, serendipitous uh, pursuits. Um, and he says, and then he says, also, speaking of connections, were you a fan of the James Burke Connections TV series? So there we are. Funnily enough, uh, the James Burke, uh, Burke Connections TV series was absolutely wonderful, but I never sort of managed to catch it when I was a child. I don't know why. I, I keep catching it now. I keep seeing um, excerpts of it or bits of it on YouTube. So I seem to have missed out on it. Um, I don't know how that how I didn't watch enough television when I was young, I guess. Um, but uh, sorry, Said, I'm going to have to ask you to remind me of the first part. Sorry, of the yeah, I, 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 I stumbled on it so much. Connections and serendipity. That's it? right, exactly. Um, well, I, I think that there there is no doubt that what you need to do is put your brain together with other people's brains uh, and come up with surprising uh, answers if you're an innovator it doesn't work to go off and think the answer out yourself. Uh, it's a surprisingly conversational process. Um, uh, and there's quite a nice example of, of, of this recently. What was, uh, damn, what, what was it? I was, I've lost my train of thought on that. But uh, it's certainly true that, 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 uh, that it, works, uh, it works to, um, to, to, to be talking to other people and sharing ideas with them. Uh, to get new ideas. Uh, that's an absolutely critical part of it, and we need to find ways to encourage that, definitely. I know what it was I was trying to think of. There's a site called Innocentive, which, where you can get a reward for solving someone else's problem. You can go on this site uh, and find that somebody has posted an engineering or a software problem that they, they're grappling with. A company may have posted it or a as any organization and if you're very clever you can solve it for them and they will uh, reward you and uh, this seems very straightforward but if you study what's been happening on that site over the last 10 years or so surprisingly often the person that solves the problem is not working in the field he's working in a different field just as uh, you know famously uh, john harrison solved the longitude problem by building better clocks Everybody thought you were going to measure longitude at sea by some clever astronomical 
solution. In fact, the answer was just to have reliable clocks that you could keep on board ships and they didn't lose time. Um, so um, quite often, the, 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 what, what works really well is having two people from different areas come together and share their ideas. My favorite example of what I call ideas having sex is the invention of the pill camera. I've told this story before. It came about after a conversation over a garden fence between a gastroenterologist and a guided missile designer. Right, next question from the IA's Andy Mayer. He says, is Cummins too market skeptic and too enamored of grand, pro uh, grand projects or grand projets moonshots to really shake up innovation policy in the post-Brexit world? <laughs> yeah, 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 good question, Andy. Um, um, I do worry that the strand of thought that Dominic Cummings represents, while very pro-science, pro-tech, pro-innovation uh, in principle, falls into the trap of thinking that government plays too central a role. And I argue very strongly in my piece, that in my book, that um, uh, most of the case histories that are adduced to show that government is the central actor in innovation uh, are misleading, in particular the ones produced by Mariana Mazzucato in her books. Um, uh, and, and I think, you know, I mean, yes, it's true that some, a lot of the technologies involved in the internet came out of DARPA, uh, a lot of stuff came out of the Defense Department, etc. cetera, um, uh, but uh, GPS and things like that. But that's like the beaver taking credit for the Hoover Dam. Quite often, this was a distant upstream uh, prototype that still had to be turned into something realistic and available uh, downstream. And the idea that the internet was fully formed within DARPA is just, I'm sorry, it's just a mistake. Uh, it's just not true. M many of the technologies that made the internet possible came from the private sector. Um, uh, and uh, many came from uh, different directions. You know, there's, you sometimes hear the example that, the, you know, the touch screen came out of a, of a government project. Well, when you dig closely, what they mean by that is that the government was funding a PhD researcher in, I think, Wisconsin or something, and one of the things he came up with was touch screens. But they weren't funding him to produce touch screens. They were just funding his PhD on whatever it was. So it's not... The, the, we, we mustn't fall into the mistake of thinking that DARPA um, uh, created magical things by being centralized and directed. Most of the brilliant stuff DARPA did came when its key people left DARPA and went off and set up Xerox Park and things like that uh, in, in California. Um, so Terence Keeley argues. Um, so yes, if I, if Dominic Cummings were listening into this podcast, and I hope he is, um, I would urge him to be careful not to be too uh, central uh, intelligent design, central planning uh, about innovation. To let a thousand flowers bloom and see what happens is crucial. That reminds me of uh, one of my heroes, Bert Rattan, who was the uh, the guy who won the prize uh, for the first privately uh, private ship, privately funded spacecraft to enter space. It was the Ansari X Prize. And he was very critical w when he was explaining his design of some of the things that NASA did. He said NASA did it in a much more expensive way, such as heat shields, for example, to re-enter orbit. Uh, but if you change the angle of approach, you didn't need as many um, heat shields. Um, and he said, but you know, because they could just throw money at it, they quite often came up with the most expensive result. Um, well, and of course, Samuel Langley's um, attempt to build an airplane was hugely funded by the American government and was a complete flop, whereas the Wright brothers were two bicycle mechanics from Ohio with absolutely zero uh, support from central government. And as somebody put it the other day, it was rather a nice point, which I'd never heard before, but uh, um, Orville Wright did not have a pilot's license. Very well put. Think about uh, it. Um, <laughs> next question um, on, from anonymous attendee says, great innovation often comes from war. Do you think this can be applied to COVID-19, which has often been painted with warlike tropes? 
Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and I, I, I think it will apply to COVID-19. I think we will see a burst of innovation. I think we're already seeing it uh, in the very fact we're all familiar with Zoom nowadays. Um, but also it will cause us to accelerate the approval of vaccines, of therapeutics, of diagnostics. Uh, we hopefully will shake up medical licensing, which has been very sluggish. Uh, I mean, complained in the book, which was written before COVID started, um, about the fact that it takes up to 70 months to get approval for a new medical device. Well, you know, that's why people go off and design video games instead of designing new point of care uh, diagnostic tests for viral diseases, for example, and why we were so shorthanded of these things when it started, and why vaccines take just as long to develop as they did in the 1960s. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we hopefully will shake all that up. But I would put in one caveat which is that a lot of the things that we think of as accelerated by war in terms of technology were not. The computer, for example, um, uh, or antibiotics. The, the, the Oxford team applied to the Wellcome Trust to develop um, Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin into a medication just before war broke out. And basically the answer got, the got was, because the war's broken out, we can't give you very much money, so you, you'll have to do it on a shoestring. So I think history would have shown that penicillin would have developed faster without uh, the outbreak of war. The same is true of the computer. The magical year in the history of the computer is 1937. That's the year in which um, not only uh, uh, Alan Turing, but... Um, uh, Claude Shannon and and uh, a, a brilliant guy in Germany and a guy in Iowa and so all all designed prototypes or thought about the principles of computers in in ways that were absolutely revolutionary um, and then suddenly all of them go off into different silos and can't talk to each other during the war and all they're doing is calculating the trajectory of artillery shells uh, or whatever it might be. Uh, and then when the war is over, they come back together and there's an explosion of computer development. So I genuinely think the computers would have developed much faster in the 1940s without war. Nuclear weapons are, of course, a counterexample. I doubt we would have developed nuclear weapons in the 1940s if we were not uh, in the middle of a world war. Um, but we would have developed them at, at some point. So I, I, I think... You know, obviously, the wars encourage the development of certain things, but I suspect they slow down the development of other things. Um, just a reminder to our viewers, um, if you want to go to the Q&A function on Zoom and vote for the questions, that will help me choose which questions to ask in the time available. And if you're watching on YouTube, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button to subscribe to our IA YouTube channel, IA London. Uh, Matt, next question. It, it says, Matt, you have spoken out about the benefits of innovation in tobacco harm reduction products. How can the UK become the world leaders in harm reduction innovation post-Brexit? That is to say, what would you advise the UK government to do to enable further innovation? Really good question and right up my alley. Um, uh, the UK pioneered the concept of harm reduction back in the 1980s when it, when it was a question of HIV. Um, the people catching the AIDS virus uh, through contaminated needles uh, drug addicts, were essentially told in most of the world, you're breaking the law, you're evil people, we're not going to help you, bad luck, you've got a disease. Whereas in Britain, Norman Fowler, as health secretary, said, no, what we should do is we should go and give these people clean needles, hand them out for free. You can't do that. These are drug, drug users, you know. Well, we tried it. We got about 1% uh, um, uh, HIV infection of heroin users after a period, whereas the equivalent figure in America was something like 30 or 40 percent. So harm reduction really does work, you know, saying, I want you to do a less dangerous version of what you're doing. It's not, a, it's not safe. Drug use is not safe. But uh, this is less dangerous than doing it uh, with, without clean needles. The same people who did that were then still in the civil service when vaping came along nearly 20 years later. And were influential in the government taking a decision in this country, much more than in any other country, to let vaping flourish. And David Halpern, running the nudge unit, was actually very influential here. 
because thanks to Rory Sutherland, he got the point very early on that this could be a safer form of smoking. Uh, and if it could displace smoking, it could save lives, uh, even if it wasn't 100% safe. And he persuaded David Cameron to reject the advice of the public health nannies that this technology should be banned. And as a result, the UK has one of the uh, leading take-ups of vaping and one of the fastest falling rates of lung cancer in the world. Uh, the contrast with America is very sharp where vaping has been officially disapproved of and therefore has gone black market like drug drinks did in the 1920s under prohibition and has become very unsafe. Whereas in this country, we focus on making sure vaping is safe rather than making sure it's discouraged. Um, there's a constant battle going on here, but Britain really did steal a march on the rest of Europe, on the rest of the world. I mean, vaping is still uh, pretty well illegal in Australia um, uh, and uh, on America. Uh, and um, it, was a, it was a time of great innovation. Look at the vape shops. Look at the technologies that developed. Look at the, 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 the ferment of people trying different ways of, of marketing these devices, the, the way they changed very rapidly from things that looked like cigarettes to things that didn't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It was a really interesting case history uh, of innovation, and it was a lifesaver for a lot of people. The fact that it, it may not be 100% safe means that the Daily Mail will constantly be tiresome on the subject. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it's not saving lives. It's saving lives on a huge scale. I'm going to ask uh, three questions combined because they seem to be related, and if not, I'll come back to you on those. So Ayush Modi asks, what characteristics do you think differentiate innovators from inventors? Louise Ross asks, what characteristics should we nurture in our children to develop new innovators? And Charles Prickett asks, how important is an acceptance by society that failure is acceptable in innovation and enterprise? I think those are related. Yeah, but they are. Really, yeah. They're all really good questions. And the answer to them all is in some ways similar, because I think what we tend to think uh, and tend to tell each other is that what we need is to teach our children creativity. Um, and uh, that means some kind of spark of uh, brilliance and free thinking and, and strangeness and uh, unusual ways of combining ideas. And yes, that might help a bit. But I think if you, it, what it tends to do is leave us with the impression that, that great innovators and great inventors are very special people, that they stand out from the crowd, that they had something about them that was genius-like. And I think that's wrong. I think that's a myth. If you look at what distinguishes Jeff Bezos and Thomas Edison and James Dyson and, um, uh, you know, George Stevenson, it's that they tried things. They experimented. They failed. And then they tried again. They worked really hard. It, obstinance, ob obstinacy and persistence uh, and perseverance. These are the characteristics of great innovation. And we can all have that. You know, there's nothing to stop anybody having it. And so I'm trying to say that innovators are surprisingly ordinary people who just try a bit harder uh, than uh, um, other people um, at, at doing these kind of things. There's a wonderful phrase that was used about the Wright brothers by the um, person who took a photograph of their first flight uh, at Roanoke, North Virginia. Not Roanoke, what, 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 I can't remember the name of the place where they flew, but um, on, the, on the North Carolina Barrier oh, Carolina. Islands. And he said, these were the two workingest boys I ever saw. Workingest. Yes. <laughs> it's a great line. I wonder if I could ask, go back to Aisha's question. Uh, do, what characteristics do you think differentiate between innovators from inventors? Can you distinguish between the two? Yes, I think one can to some extent. Uh, and, you know, so let's take uh, um, Joseph Swan and Thomas Edison, who ended up kind of in business together. Swan deserves more credit as the inventor of the light bulb than Edison, but he doesn't deserve as much credit as the innovator of the light bulb, is the way I'd put it. And Swan is a, you know, a bearded grandee from 
the northeast of England, um, and he does this br these brilliant demonstrations in the Literary and Philosophical Society in Newcastle of, of lighting a, his lecture with an electric light bulb. It's a, it's a you know it's an incredible moment in history, and it's it's pretty well the first to achieve it on such a, a level. But he doesn't then go back into his workshop and try five thousand different materials to improve the filament of the light bulb to make it more reliable and last longer. And that's what Edison does. 5,000 different types of plant. Japanese bamboo was the one he eventually settled on. Now, um, that I think is, is the distinction between the inventor and the innovator, that the, the innovator um, just does more drudgery, um, you know, <laughs> is prepared to, to put in the the elbow grease, the long hours to Perspiration, turn. not inspiration necessarily. Yeah, that's the, the other great um, uh, Edison quote is 99% perspiration or 1% inspiration. Um, uh, the place you were thinking of was, uh, I think it was Kitty Hawk, wasn't it, in North Carolina? Thank you. Thank that's you, right, Kitty yeah. Hawk. Yeah. Um, next question. Why is the UK good at ideas, but bad at bringing those ideas to market? And how can we improve that? I know that's a question we've been asking for a very long time here in the UK. Yeah. It? I mean, it goes back to the 1940s, you get people complaining about that in the UK. Uh, it's been a chronic problem all along. Um, and I would say that it, in the end, it's because we misread innovation. We think that the, 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 the posh bit of in innovation, the bit, the respectable bit, the bit that, you know, proper people do is the original prototype, not the development of something that act, people actually want. We don't respect or reward the, the 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 person who gets down and sells stuff to the same degree that they do in countries like the US. That's a sort of psychobabble explanation, if you like, for it. Um, but I would say it's probably expressed in a slightly more conventional explanation, which is that the funding tends to um, dry up at the critical moment in terms of British uh, innovations. Uh, that, that we generously fund the discovery of original ideas, but then we don't keep, we don't have the patient capital that keeps funding it um, through the valley of death where you sell out to the Americans um, uh, or the Chinese. Uh, and therefore, we end up not owning it uh, here. And there's lots of examples. And, you know, I mean, I watched this fantastic um, fast genome sequencing technology that Solexa developed in, in Cambridge and was sold to Illumina and in California, and it's the world standard now. Um, uh, I watched the same thing with uh, genetically modified insects, a really interesting technology that came out of... Um, uh, Oxitech in Oxford and has ended up belonging to Intrexon and a big American company. So the, the the reason we sell out too early is somehow because we don't have this psychological, cultural determination to see the process through, uh, I fear. But it might have something to do with incentives. I mean, it could well be that that we just haven't got the entrepreneur's relief right, the EIS system right, the tax incentives right. Uh, the share structures, right? You know, Californian split share structure, where you can sell three quarters of your company but still be in control of it, is probably quite an important factor here. Okay, so we've got about uh, just under ten minutes left. So, if the viewers can help me, we've got ten open questions. We're not going to get through them all, so please help me by going to the Q and A function and voting on the best question in your opinion. Uh, Richard Parsonson asks, "How optimistic can we be about innovation?" and economic freedom, given the extraordinary current level of government interventionism and spending in the economy, financial repression, growing trade protectionism, et cetera. How do we dig ourselves out of all of this? I'm quite worried about the degree to which we are creating an innovation famine by having far too much uh, government intervention in the economy, far too big a uh, regulatory state, far too um, much influence from uh, lobby groups and pressure groups like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, who are basically against innovation. Um, uh, all these factors are making Britain not quite as much as the rest of Europe, um, and to some extent even America, um, countries that have forgot are forgetting how to do innovation. 
and it is a real problem. And, you know, the reason we've had sluggish productivity growth over the last 10 years, we haven't done that much innovation. We think we have because of all the electronic devices that have changed in our lives. But that's the only place where we've had permissionless innovation. If you want to invent a new app, no one's going to stop you. You don't have to have. You don't have to get a new survey before you invent a new app. Whereas you do if you're going to invent something physical and do something practical. Um, you know, someone like James Dyson, who's actually trying to make vacuum cleaners or whatever, faces much bigger hurdles uh, than people in the software industry. Um, so I, I would like to see a a radical revision of the way um, uh, we think about. Uh, innovators and not pour money after them and try and subsidize them and all that kind of thing because we'll only pick losers if we do but just clear the undergrowth out of the way for them to proceed a particular pet peeve of mine is how long decisions get take to be taken um uh, by uh, the authorities uh, you know if you're a businessman trying to set up a business in china you basically get the go-ahead from the local planners in a matter of weeks here you might take five years to get planning permission um, uh, or regulatory approval i talked about medical devices earlier so it's not that planners and regulators say no it's that they take an age to say yes i mean they actually did say yes to the genetically modified potato that uh, BASF wanted to produce. But it took them eight years, by which time BASF had said, forget this, we're off to America. Likewise with fracking. Um, uh, you know, the companies that wanted to do fracking here um, were never told they couldn't. They just kept being told, oh, we can't make up our minds for another. So speedier decision would be the thing I would most want if I was able to wave a magic wand over Whitehall. Well, you're talking about Whitehall, we've got three questions, uh, all I think maybe will, will be related, but we'll make them related to get them all uh, asked. Uh, Daniel Kremen, Ian Taylor, and Hunter DeBose. And so I'll uh, ask them together. Michael Gove and Dominic Cummings want to spur on a more innovative climate within government. This is hard to do in practice due to the civil service outlook, but also status like Matt Hancock. What can be done to break through? How do we avoid simply creating yet more quangos that soon revert to type? Hold that thought from Daniel Kremen. Ian Taylor asks how much danger to both our freedom to innovate and economic recovery might be posed by a combination post-COVID of risk aversion and bureaucracy in general. And the third related question from Hunter DeBose, what is the best thing that governments can do to promote innovation? Is it simply to get out of the way and reduce all potential regulatory barriers? Or are there targeted state programs, such as tax incentives, accounting treatments, that can spur on innovation without distorting the market? So all questions about why tool and barriers to innovation. Mm. I think I'm going to try and answer all three at once with the following observation. If you do legislation and regulation right, you might end up encouraging innovation rather than discouraging it. It doesn't happen very often, um, but consider the following example. The Clinton administration in the United States passed through Congress a series of laws in the late 1990s that were intended to facilitate e-commerce, online uh, business activity. Um, they included the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which has become a little bit notorious. It essentially means that websites are platforms, not publishers, uh, and that kind of thing. But they all, in one way or another, were amazingly permissive and libertarian. The, the, there, was a, there was a brief moment of consensus then between all political parties that what we want to do is find rules that will encourage people to do it. A bit like standardizing the electricity system so that everybody can build a device that you know plugs in in different parts of the country and still works um you know those are the kinds of things you you can do and if you contrast that with the way we regulate for example the nuclear industry where we uh, demand such huge fees to approve a regulator, a design through the regulatory system and take so long to do it, 
that it's impossible for someone to try anything new because you know what you, you don't want to waste 800 million pounds and get turned down for regulatory approval so you don't submit anything new essentially that's that's what happens in the in the nuclear system so it's been stuck unable to regulate for the unable to innovate for the last uh, 40 or 50 years so i'd like to think that there are areas where we could go with the approach that they that the clinton administration tried in the 1990s and say look here we're going to pass some regulations that actually make it easier for a for an innovator that tell the innovator where he is and make it clear that he can find a path through. Now, if, for example, we were to do this for nuclear fusion before it's even a reality, we might attract extraordinary investment into that nascent industry uh, in this country, which has already got some exciting technology uh, development companies in that area. Uh, uh, and goodness knows what might happen if we were to do it, for example, for gene editing, um, which... Uh, at the moment, in the, uh, the, we've inherited from the European Union uh, a definition of, uh, of a gene-edited um, plant that is completely unworkable, that makes it impossible for anyone to ever contemplate putting one of these things on the market because it would take five years to get regulatory approval. Um, but if we were to say, no, actually, uh, here's a much simpler, quicker system, uh, all we need to do is say you, you, you need... Uh, you know, well, I won't go into the details, but if we were to do that, then again, we would encourage it. So I would like to think that the answer lies in better regulation um, rather than deregulation, because the word deregulation does frighten the horses quite unnecessarily. And, you know, what we're talking about here is a race to the top. You know, if we can do gene editing, then we won't need so many chemicals on our fields. That's a race to the top environmentally, not a race to the bottom. Let me ask you a very quick question. Uh, I know we're coming up two minutes to the hour. Um, from Tim Guinness, who builds on that, that in terms of um, in, uh, incentives or barriers to innovation. And he asks about tax treatment, EIS or VCT, tax advantages given to investors. Do you, he said, do you think we can improve the structure of those in early stage growth companies to help innovation? Or are these schemes irrelevant uh, to innovation? I don't think these schemes are irrelevant. I think it's one of the best features of the coalition government uh, in 2010 was that it did put in place some pretty good incentives for early stage investment uh, and for entrepreneurs to uh, stick by their companies and to benefit from starting companies. And as a result, by 2015, Britain was starting more companies every year than the rest of Europe put together, I think. No, maybe not quite put together, but you know, twice as many as the nearest country in Europe. Now, that's extraordinary. Now, quite a lot of those were hairdressers and things that weren't going to grow into you know, digital giants. Um, uh, but th a lot of that was down to entrepreneurs' relief, uh, EIS, uh, and these various other tax treatments of, um, uh, of uh, uh, enterprise. And I actually worked in sort of 2013 on trying to help and get an improvement to entrepreneurs' relief, um, which I think we did eventually get, um, that would make it slightly less disincentivizing um, uh, in one particular way. And I'm sure there are more examples of that that we could do. Um, uh, and, you know, I don't think VCTs have been a huge success in terms of encouraging innovation. They've tended to end up focusing on um, uh, old uh, on existing technologies rather than uh, encouraging new ones but i think eis has been very helpful uh, and i think entrepreneurs relief has too so uh, yes i think there is stuff you can do through the tax system but i'm not a tax expert so i wouldn't like to go into too much detail well matt on that note matt ridley uh, author of how innovation works thank you very much for joining us this evening to discuss the ideas in your book and far more can i thank the viewers for joining us today i hope you found it as fascinating as I did, if you can judge that by the number of questions, clearly it provoked a lot of thought and response. Uh, we have a regular schedule of online content, updating content every day. Please check that out on our YouTube channel, IA London, or our website, ia.org.uk. Tomorrow, our next academic webinar is with Professor Martin Ricketts, who will be discussing whether economics as a discipline undermines the case for state action or the case for markets. That's one o'clock tomorrow. Please join us for that. Um, tomorrow at six o'clock, tune in live. Uh, tune in for Live with Littlewood with the IEA's very own Mark Littlewood and a stellar lineup of 
guests discussing the weekly the week's events um, and no doubt more to do with uh, innovation, COVID, uh, lockdown, um, people, uh, freedom, liberty, all those issues. For more details of all our online content and to stay updated on our activity, visit our website, ia.org.uk, check out our YouTube channel, IA London, listen to our podcast on Podbean, or subscribe to, to IA Daily. And to help us keep providing free content during these tough times, please do consider making a contribution, no matter how modest, by donating online at ia.org.uk. Thank you very much for watching or listening today. I hope that you'll be able to join us again soon. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe. And Matt, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Said. Really great conversation. Uh, enjoyed all the questions very much. Great.